nulahu muslimun sadaqallah sadaqallah al-azim Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters I read to you an ayah from the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He gives us directions as to how we are to do the job and how not to do the job He's telling us what to do how to do This ayah is from Surah Ankabut Ankabut Where will you find Ankabut in an encyclopedia of this size the Quran This encyclopedia this is the translation of the Holy Quran 2000 pages 114 surahs chapters Are you going to start paging through look for Ankabut 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 then you missed it and you start again you got the time for that Who has the time for that In this day and age when everybody is involved in a rat race you got time to start paging through looking for Ankabut Now how do we find Ankabut in an encyclopedia of the size Any young man any young man any student any student now the brother has already given the answer so he said, he said the index i was going to present to any of our student who would give me the right answer i would have given him this book called the choice embossed gold from south africa islam and christianity by ahmed didat i was going to present that this brother he was too fast he already <laughs> let the cat out of the bag so this book remains with me for the moment <laughs> an encyclopedia of that size how do you find an kabut so you go to the index index this volume has got an index a very comprehensive index anything that you want to know you want to know about marriage in islam marriage look under m marriage everything about marriage with whom you can with whom you can't how many how many how many wives can you have <laughs> no no you go to the index <laughs> you go to the index what does the quran say and the m marriage find out everything about marriage you know about divorce where you find divorce in the quran go to the quran the index look for divorce it will tell you how to do the job if you must my people are used to getting angry and say talaq 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 finish no no allah says don't do things like that he lays down a system but nobody knows the system because nobody really reads the quran go to the index you find a surah called surah talaq divorce the whole chapter is dedicated to talaq how to do the job anything else you want to know about salat allah says look at the prophet You want to know about zakat? So look at the prophet. You know about hajj? Look at the prophet. You want to know about psalm, fasting? Look at the prophet. About divorce? He doesn't say look at the prophet. Because looking at the prophet means it implies that our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam he must divorce one of his wives, our mother. He must divorce one of our mothers to show us how to divorce. What a filthy dirty thing to do. Allah will not allow his messenger to do that. So it he reveals the details salat details are not there wudu details are not there all the details of salat zakat hajj som is not there look at the prophet his life his life talaq mm -hmm. don't look at his life look at the quran he spells it out for you what do you want to know you want about jesus and the jail everything about jesus on your fingertips man and this volume this vast volume of 2000 pages is available to you downstairs you know for how much 10 dollars in america a book 2000 pages for 10 dollars is bakshish man his hadiya is mahala is says free free is a gift 2000 pages for 10 dollars there's not another book in america you can buy 2000 pages even newsprint you can buy 2000 pages for 10 dollars it's available here downstairs you owe it to yourself you owe it as it get this book This book besides giving you everything on your fingertips heaven or hell justice 
Muhammad What does this book say? What the Quran says about Muhammad? Everything about that. What the Quran says about the Quran? Everything about that. What do you want to know, man? Everything on your fingertips. And you need it. We in America, we need it. Even the Arab needs it. <laughs> Mark my words. I said, you Arabs, you understand the Quran? You say yes. You understand when you read it? You said yes. Hmm? Inshallah, you understand what you read. It's your language. But I say you need a translation. If you understand what I'm talking to you now, you Arabs, I'm telling the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, all of them. I said, you, do you understand as I'm talking to you now? Do you understand me? They said yes. I said, then you need a translation. It's quite all right. Quite all right. Quite all right. if you all settle down, we can get started. I am telling my brethren in the Middle East, the Arabic speaking people, I said, you understand what I, as I'm talking to you now? They said, yes. Then I said, you need a translation. If you don't understand me while I'm talking to you, then you don't need a translation. <laughs> if you understand me, you need a translation. If you don't understand me, you don't need a translation. You know why? If you don't understand me, which means you don't know English. So what are you going to do with the translation? But if you understand me, you need a translation. Why? Why do you need a translation if you understand me? I says, now you understand this Quran, Alhamdulillah. But now if you are, you understand between you and Allah, no problem. Between you and Allah, no problem. You don't need a translation. Between you and Him, you don't need a translation. But as soon as you want to speak, to the non-Muslim, the American, Afro-American, or Caucasian, or Hispanic, as soon as you want to speak to him, you need a translation. Because you need the right vocabulary, the right terminology, the right construction of sentences. And I carried out an experiment in Dahran University, mostly Saudi students, at the university in Dahran. I'm asking them, Bismillah rahman rahim I said, I want to know how many of you know this ayah. How many of you know this verse? Bismillah rahman rahim Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya maryamu Inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisail alameen I said, how many of you understand what I read just now? So 80% of the students said, do you know this verse? Do you know this verse? 80% put up the hands. I said, those of you who are half of the Quran, put your hands down. About a quarter dozen put the hands down. Still, the bulk of the students still got the hands up. That they know this verse. They know this ayah. So I said, are you all half of the Quran? He says, no. Then how do you know? No, no, it's your language. And once you're used to listening, 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 it becomes a part of you without you being the half of the Quran. You don't know the whole Quran, but this verse you know. 80% of the students, they know this verse. They are not Hafiz, but they know the verse. I said, now, I want you to do me a favor. So you, my brother, come forward, read the ayah, and I want you to translate it to the American. Let's imagine these guys are all Americans here. Tell them now, what did you read? One man. So the man comes, he's a student, student. Here is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَحَرَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ Perfect, perfect. Right, translation. It says, you know, uh, the angel, the angel come to Maryam and tell her, he says, Oh Maryam, say Allah like you very much. He says, clean you, clean you up. And he says, he like you better than any other woman. Astaghfirullah. 
What you doing to the Quran? You murdering the Quran. You murdering the Quran. You mean well. Allah won't punish you. But you are actually murdering the Quran. Allah doesn't speak like that. You see? I said, what you do is, now, you Arabs, you students, you need a translation. You need it. Another one, another one. Same, you murdering the Quran, you murdering the Quran. Between you and Allah, there was no problem. You understand very well. But now to put it to the non-Muslim, what did you read? <laughs> you want to murder the Quran. Don't murder the Quran. Don't mutilate the Quran. So I says, now you get a translation. And this particular one here, I have in my hand. This has an ayah by ayah translation, verse by verse. You read. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa is qalatil malaika tu ya Maryamu. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, purified thee, wa stafaki ala nisa al-alameen, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Ya Maryamu kmuti li rabbiki, wa sjudi warka imar raqeen. So, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly, prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. Thalika min anbai al-ghaybi, this is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee, O Apostle, by inspiration and so on. I said, learn this now. Learn the English. You know the Arabic verse? MashaAllah. Now learn the English side by side. Memorize it. Memorize it. You learn new vocabulary, new words, terminology. You learn new construction of sentences. Once you have done the job, I says, you know, you are set. You are set to go to America. What you do, you need practice. Because once you go to America, you're going to have a problem with language. This is the major problem of the students coming from the Middle East. First thing here in this country for the first three years, problem number one, language. First year, biggest problem, language. Second year, biggest problem, language. Third year, biggest problem, language. Fourth year, language might take second place, third place. You have other priorities. But first three years, every student that comes from Kuwait, from Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, to learn education at your universities, the problem number one is language, 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 language. You listen to the Americans talking, and all of a sudden they all burst out laughing, and you don't know what they're laughing about. Look, it happens to me. I seem to know English so well, but I, I can't get the joke. I don't know what the hell they're laughing about. You see, this colloquial language. You, um, Arabs, you know, you are in a worse position than me. I live in a Western society, and still I find your Americanism, you know, a bit difficult to, to grasp. So, I says, now I want you to practice. And how many Americans are here? I'm asking the students. They say there are 10,000 at the oil wells there. 10,000. I said, you've got 10,000 customers. Your professors, every non-Muslim, every visitor you see, a white man, a Caucasian, whether he's French, German, or British, or American, start, start with him. So, good morning, sir. So, good morning. I said, you know, we believe in Jesus. So what? What? The guy's wondering whether what you want, a cigarette from him, chocolate, what do you want? Huh? Why are you telling him this? You wanted to carry favor with him? So you know we believe that Jesus is one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life back to the dead by Allah's permission, of healing those born blind and the lepers by Allah's permission. This guy is thinking you are trying to carry favor with him. You want some favor. Now, so, do you know what the Quran says, sir? He says, no. It says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, purified thee, wa tafaki ala nisa al alameen, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Go on, man, go on. Find customers and talk, talk. Every time you utter Allah's kalam, you get blessings. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that every letter of the Quranic terminology you utter, for every letter you get ten, 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 ten sabahs, blessings. He said, Alif, Lam, Mim. He said, Alif, Lam, Mim is not a word, there are three letters. And when you say Alif, Lam, Mim, you get ten, 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 thirty sabahs. Everybody. You heard me say that, I got thirty, and every one of you got thirty, thirty.
سب آپ نے بھی بڑھی جیسے بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ہم نے لیٹرز دے نائنٹین آئی گوڈ ہنڈر نائنٹی بلیسنگ سب آپ اور ایوری ون آف یو یو ہرڈ می یو گوڈ ہنڈر نائنٹی سب آپ گو ان دو بزنس ویڈ ہم دو بزنس ویڈ ہم بغیر حساب دون سات کیونگ کاؤنٹ لیو ایٹو ہم تو کیپ کاؤنٹ In his computer, he will keep count for you. On the day of judgment, inshallah, he'll give it to you. So, every time you utter Allah's kalam, you say, وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ يَا مَرْيَمُ I haven't taken the trouble to count. But every letter, ten, 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 ten. Now, behold, the angel said, O Mary, man, that new vocabulary, a new construction of sentences, you are getting used to it. And getting more and more confidence. Every time you speak, You're getting bolder and bolder. The tongue, the tongue is the only edge tool which grows sharper with use. Every other tool, screwdriver, knife, the more you use it, it gets blunt. Screw, every tool which has a, got an edge, it gets blunt with use. The tongue is the only edge tool, the more you use, the more fluent it gets, the sharper it gets. Do you know that? The more you use, the sharper it gets. Man, <laughs> blessings, blessings, blessings. And the language. The language is a masterpiece of the English language. This translation is a masterpiece of the English language. Your children and yourself don't have to read Shakespeare and Milton to improve your English even. The language, the English itself, it seems as if it's inspired. It is not. It is not. But no Westerner can believe that an Oriental could have written that. Blessings, blessings, blessings. And how much? Ten dollars each. I said, you owe it to yourself and your families to have one this in the house and take the trouble you two. Learn the ayah if you don't know. Learn the ayah, memorize the ayah and memorize the translation. And find opportunities, man. You know, you are living in an ocean of Christianity. Talk, man, talk. Open your mouth. Say, you know, we Muslims believe in Jesus. Say, yes. So you know what the Quran says? It says, no. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman. Get started, man. The Christian, he does that. He says, Jesus said, I am the Father, I am one. He that has seen me has seen the Father. No man come out of the... And that guy, he memorized one bloody verse and he makes a religion out of it. Huh? And he's going and he's doing his job and he's getting converts. Right. <laughs> Let's come back to our Surah An-Kabut. Surah An-Kabut, to find, go to the index. Under A, look for Ankabut. This is chapter 29. Easy to find. Every page is numbered. Ayah number 46. Easy to find because every verse is numbered. Found it? Go home. I'm suggesting that you go home and look this up in your own translations. Not that you're doubting me or the Imam at any time. Somebody gives you a reference from the Holy Quran that they have, a, they have any reason to deceive you. No, no, no. Nobody wants to deceive you. But if you go home and you check up, you see it with your own eyes and you read it with your own heart and mind, that knowledge will become a part of your own property and in turn will be able to share with others. From that point, I said, go home and check it up. Ankabut, look for Ankabut in your Quran. If you haven't got it, buy one. Ten dollars each. Go and borrow ten dollars from somebody if you haven't got it in your pocket. Ten dollars each. Two thousand pages. Ten dollars each. And improvement. Check up. Chapter 29, ayah number 46. Allah says, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِيَ أَحْسَنِ And dispute not. Don't argue. Don't debate with the Ahl al-Kitab. Who's Ahl al-Kitab? Who? Who are Ahl al-Kitab? Jews and Christians. Allah says, don't, don't dispute with them. Don't argue with them. Don't debate with them. No, he wants you to argue and debate with them. But he said, don't debate with them, except in ways better than mere disputation. In ways better than mere disputation. <laughs> What is mere disputation? What is mere disputation? He said, don't do like that. He said, like what? He said, don't do like that. To do better than that. Better than what? To what you are doing. What are you doing? What are you doing? That other said, don't do like that. Dispute. Yes, what dispute? How? Tell me, tell me. Yes, what? What are you doing that you shouldn't do? Tell me. Yes, my son. Sin. Huh? Sin. Sin. Raising your voice? Raising your voice or emotionally? Yes, sin. Argument. Yes, sin, argue. Sin, don't do like that. Allah says, ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموزة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي أحسن. and argue and debate and reason with them. he's telling you. but then he says, 
But don't do like that. But do better than that. Better than what? I tell you. You see, I met a Christian priest. Somewhere out in my country, a thousand miles away from where I live, in a shop, Muslim shop. See, he tells me, says, you know, Mr. Didat, I've been watching your tapes. Oh, incidentally, my videotapes are also available downstairs. Five dollars each. Five dollars each. My videotapes. There are some over 60, 80, over 70 programs. They are there downstairs. Five dollars each. Buy them. Buy them. Take them home. Get the entertainment and get education. Inshallah, you'll be entertained as well as be educated. So this Christian priest, he tells me he has seen my tapes. I said, any questions? He says, no. So I'm telling him, I said, you see, the difference between us is the difference between these two books. The Quran, the Quran and the Bible. Right? He said, right. You say that the Bible is God's word. We say that the Quran is Allah's kalam. It's God's word. Right? He said, right. You say the Quran is not the word of God. We say that the Bible is not the word of God. You say that we Muslims are going to go to hell. Yes, yes, yes. He says, you Muslims are going to go to hell. Now when you pray five times a day, you pray 50 times a day. Who died for your sins? Christ died for mine, he says. Who died for yours? And you start searching. You, t- you put into an orbit, looking for somebody who died for your sins. <laughs> Did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam die for your sins? He says, no. Abu Bakr Siddiq, Omar, Usman, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, who? Nobody. Nobody. So you seem that you are bankrupt. Look, that guy's got something. Somebody died for his sins. He paid for his fines. For all his crimes. Huh? No. Man, if it is true, it's the most fantastic religion on earth. I'll tell you all, so come, let's join them, man. Man, you can do what you like, have all the pleasures of life and go to Jannah. You don't have to do anything. You just have only believe that Christ died for your sins and salvation, Jannah is for you. Man, it's the most fantastic religion, if it's true. If it's true, it's the most fantastic way of going to Jannah. Damn it all, you don't have to sweat at all. Huh? You go and molest little children, hmm? and Christ pays for it. Hitler, Hitler, he incinerated six million Jews. So they say we accept it. Don't argue. Even six thousand is bad enough. Killing a person for his race, it's bad. Just because he's a Jew, killing him because he's a Jew, not because he's a murderer, he's a thief, he's a mm-hmm. just because he's a Jew, bad enough. Even six hundred, too bad. This is six million, sir, six million Jews. On account of him, 40 million people died in the Second World War. 40 million! But he's going to go to heaven. You know, because he's a Christian. Christ died for his sins. I say, you like that? You like that? You British, you like that? That guy goes to heaven. Because he believes in Jesus Christ. That guy Sutcliffe, he raped and ripped 13 women. But he's a born again Christian. He raped and ripped 13 women. But he's serving a double life sentence in prison. But he's going to go to heaven. You know why? Because Christ died for his sins. Huh? This guy in Atlanta, Georgia, who sodomized 21 boys and murdered them. Hmm? He's going to go to heaven. You know why? Because Christ died for his sins. This guy in 533 in New York, 533, that Ferguson fellow, hmm? he killed six guys and another 17 he injured. He's going to go to heaven. You know that? Even if he's hanged here, he's going to go to heaven because he's a born again Christian. Do you know that? He's a fundamentalist. Nobody says that. A Christian fanatic. No, no, nobody says that. He's a fundamentalist. Nobody says that. He's a fundamentalist. His landlord says, his landlord, that is in the newspapers, his landlord says, that he was living in my basement, in my house. And two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, he's singing the rock of ages, Jesus Christ. He's shaking up the bloody places, disturbing people's sleep. He is born again Christian. But nobody says that. Huh? No, this is a Christian fanatic, a Christian fundamentalist. No, no, no. Oh. If you did anything, it's a Muslim did it. Muslim fanatic, Muslim fundamentalist. Time it all, we have crackpots among us, as every nation would have. There are crack among the Jews, there are crackpots among the Christians, that uh, the David, David uh, Koresh, huh? and that guy, Reverend Jim Jones, in Jonestown, Guyana. 911 people committed suicide en masse. Born again Christian. Fanatics. There are 75 million fundamentalist Christians in America, as claimed by Billy Graham. He's written a book. Billy Graham, the great orator, he's written a book called How to Be Born Again. And in that he says there are 75 million born-again Christians in America. 
75 million, and those are fundamentalists, every one of them. He believes, each and every one of them, believe that every word, every comma, colon, full stop, in the Bible is revealed by God. He's a fundamentalist. But nobody calls him. That guy does anything silly, anything foolish. <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart, fundamentalist. You know what, what he did. Jim Baker, fundamentalist. Reverend Martin Gorman, fundamentalist. But damn it all, you don't talk about that. Muslim fundamentalist, Muslim fanatic. <laughs> Muslim poor fellow, you can say. However, so I said, the battle is between the two books. You say that the Bible is God's word, we say the Quran is. You say the Quran is not, we say the Bible is not. You say, we're going to go to hell, we say, you're going to go to hell. Allah says, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِاللَّةِ أَحْسَنِ Don't dispute with the people of the book, except by ways better than mere disputation. Don't talk like that. So you're going to go to hell, he says, you're going to go to hell. So your book is false, your book is false. That's mere disputation. Don't talk like that, Allah says. Don't talk like that. Talk better than that. How can you talk better than that? So I tell you. I said, you see, when I tell you, I'm telling the Christian, that your Bible is not the word of God, I will tell you why. You said the Quran is not, you know nothing about the Quran. But when I tell you your Bible is not the word of God, I will tell you why I say that. And to start, I said, let me give you a parable, a misal. Jesus Christ ever spoke in parables, and people love to hear stories, parables. You know, we like to hear the fox and the graves, the wolf and the lamb, anything, parable, parable, parable. Misal, in the Quran we are given so many parables. The man who killed the fire, a grain of corn, a man who lost his tongue like a dog. Parables, parables in the Quran. Go to the index and you'll find in the index under P, parables. In the Quran, who has read them? Who has read them? Nobody ever reads them, I'm telling you. In my life, I have not heard a single lecture given by any learned man in Islam on the parables of the Quran. They tell you fairy tales. I'm not insinuating against anybody. But this is my experience. In my life, I have not heard a single lecture on the parables of the Quran. I have not read a single book on the parables of the Quran. The Christian out of a mole hill makes a, makes a mountain. Little, little things, he creates a mountain out of it. We, Allah has given us so many parables, but nobody, nobody really. <laughs> so, so let me give you a parable, an example. I said, your father and your mother are sleeping. In the middle of the night, a burglar gets in, a robber, a thief. And your father wakes up and he grapples with the burglar. But the burglar is too strong. He floors your father. And he sits on his chest and he's strangling him to death. And your father is gasping for breath. <laughs> he's going to die any minute. And your mother comes to the rescue. Your mother comes to the rescue and helps your father, saves your father from the burglar. Now your father says, John, chop off your mother's hands. Chop off your mother's hands. Say, Daddy, are you joking? You joking? He said, no, my son, I'm serious. Daddy, have you been drinking? He says, no, my son, you know, we are born again Christians. You know, we are born again. We are like angels walking this earth. We don't drink. Then, Daddy, you are crazy. I'm asking the priest, right? Right? I said, this woman, your mother, who's saving your father's life, your father wants to chop off her hands, then either your dad is, is drunk or he's crazy. I said, right. Your dad says, no, my son, I'm inspired. They said, who inspires your daddy? The devil, shaitan, this is satanic, devilish. He said, no, my son, I'm inspired by God. He said, daddy, you are crazy, and the God who inspires you is also crazy. If this is God telling you to do, see, this woman gave you 40 years of endless pleasures, gave you so many beautiful children, and now she saved your life, and you want to chop off her hands? Daddy, you are crazy, and the God who inspires you is also crazy. Right? He said, right. He agrees with that logic. Anybody will agree, whether it's a Jew or a Hindu or a Christian, anybody must agree with that logic. That the woman who saves your father's life, you must chop off her hands. Your father is either mad, and if he's inspired, the guy who inspires him is also mad. Right? 
That's right. So your dad says, son, John, I can't help it. This is what God says. This is what God says in his book, the Bible, the book of God, the word of God. So where daddy is open, my son, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is the fifth book of Moses, supposed to be. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 11, 12. Now who can come forward and read it to me? Come, 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 one of you, volunteer. Somebody who can read English well, man. Come, 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 come. Come. Mashallah, come. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, chapter 25, ayah number 11 and 12. Just read it slowly that the people can follow what you are reading. 11 and 12. When men strive together. Right, right, we'll go slowly. When men strive together means they're struggling together. One with another. One with another. And the wife of one, of the one, Draweth near, draweth, draweth near, means comes near to deliver her husband, to save her husband, deliver means to save out of the hand of him, out of the hand of him that is smitten him, that smiteth him, the one who's beating him, uh -huh. and putteth forth her hand, and putteth forth her hand, and taketh him mm -hmm. by the, the secret. secret. Uh -huh. Then thou shalt, shalt cut off, thou shalt cut off her hand, her hand. Thine eye shall not pity, pity, her. Her, pity her. I have no mercy for her. Chop off this woman's hand. <laughs> this is what the Holy Bible says. <laughs> is this God's word? <laughs> Does God give you such advice? The woman who saves your father's life must chop off her hands. In the house of Islam, for certain crimes, robbers, highwaymen, is a chop off his hand. You see, we are cruel, we are barbarians. Here in your book, a woman who saves a person's life, her hands are to be chopped off. Oh, no. huh? Is that God's word? Never. So the man, the priest tells me, he said, no, there must be some explanation. I said, no, there must be. What is it? Give it to me. He said, no, there must be some explanation. I said, yes, there must be some explanation. Give it to me. <laughs> there isn't. Wallah, there isn't. Wallah, yeah. yes. This is lunacy of the highest order. But the same chapter, Verse 4, it says that the ox, do not muzzle the ox when it threaded the corn. Beautiful. You see the Jews, when the corn, the corn, you want to loosen the grain, so it's to make the ox to go over it, mm -mm 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 -mm, whole day, poor thing. And now it knows that this is food, so when it has a chance, it takes a bite, mm -hmm, tries to chew that this thing, gets a few grains and the thing falls out of his mouth mm -hmm. after 15 minutes, half an hour, gives another bite gets another piece of corn mm -hmm. so the Jews says, no man this guy, this ox is eating of the corn so the pie of the mouth this merciful God, he says, don't do that let the poor thing have, what, how much is going to eat man, let it eat I can believe that the merciful God He's telling you that. Don't muzzle the ox when it threaded the corn. I can believe that Allah is talking. But the same God who is so merciful to the ox is not merciful to the human woman. Huh? Your wife, she saves your life and it's a chop of her hands. Does it make sense? Can it be from the same God who is merciful to the ox is not merciful to the human being? Hmm. So it says now, Illa billati ahsan. Talk better than that. Don't just say your book is false and yours is false. His mine is true and you. No, no, don't talk like that, Allah said. Illa billatis. Illa ladhina zalamu minhum. Except those who cause you harm, who cause you injury. With them, you can use a sledgehammer. <laughs> our people, our brothers, good brothers, they're always quoting this Quranic ayah. They say, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with hikmah. Well, mawizat al and with beautiful preaching. Wajadilhum billati ahsan. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious, Allah says. So people will quote and tell you, they say, look, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. In other words, you're not using wisdom. Implying that you are not using wisdom. Why? Because it creates provocation. They are Muslims, good Muslims. 
They're telling me, Mr. D, that this is not the way. I said, what is the way? So Allah says, with hikmah. I said, what is hikmah? It's a wisdom. I said, that's only meaning you're giving me. Show me how to do the job. Show me how to do the job. You're not in the field. You haven't done the job in your life. And you want to teach somebody who's in the field how to do the job. I says, my brother, tell me, hikmah, what is hikmah? It's a wisdom. I said, that's a word, only a translation. Tell me, show me, what is wisdom? He said, no, you mustn't create provocation. You see, the Hindus in my country are provoked against me. The Jews are provoked against me. The Christians are provoked against me. <coughs> so he said, you see, this is not the way. So I'm suggesting, I said, look, our Nabi Karim sallam, he is the living Quran. He is the paragon of virtue. He is the best example of the Quran. Bil Hikmah, he did it. The sweetest man on earth. And he created problems for himself. You know that? As soon as he opened his mouth, the mushriks of Makkah wanted to kill him. Did you know that? Do you know that? The mushriks of Makkah wanted to kill him. Hmm? The Sahabas had to make hijrah to Abyssinia twice. He had to flee for his life to Medina. Why? Because he didn't know how to talk. That's what you say. Look, he created <laughs> provocation. The Jews wanted to kill him. The Christians wanted to kill him. The Munafis of Medina wanted to kill him. Four different groups of people. Everybody wants to kill the man. Why? Because he didn't know how to talk. You, Khabis, you can talk better than him. Hmm? You talk better than him. He created from Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah says he is an example for you. He is an example for you. This example of mankind, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, our father, Abraham, Surah Maryam, you read in Surah Maryam, that is appealing to his father. Ya bati, inni kajani min al ilmi malam yutika. And says, Oh my father, knowledge has come to me which has not reached you, so follow me and I will show you a way that is even and straight. Oh my father, oh my father, every ayah. Four ayahs in succession. Oh my father, ya bati, ya bati, ya bati, ya bati. Four times everything. My father, oh my father, my father. How does the father react? Huh? How does the father respond? Say, hey, Ibrahim, get out of my sight for a good long while. Otherwise I'll stone you to death. Why? Ibrahim al Islam didn't know how to speak. Hmm? You can speak better than him. Hmm? Our Nabi Karim he didn't know how to speak. If you were there, you would tell him, Ya Rasulullah, you know, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. You know? You're going to tell him that. He's not using hikmah. And yet he's creating provocation. His own people, the mushriks, they want to kill him. The Jews want to kill him. The Christians want to kill him. The Munafis want to kill him. So he didn't know hikmah. No, no. This is the nature of haq and batil. When you speak haq, when truth is heard against falsehood, it knocks out its brains. When your brain is knocked out, how do you behave? You go berserk, man. You hit and hurt anybody. Hurt yourself in the process. This is the nature of truth and batil. Provocation. So Allah says, Illa billati ahsan, illa ladina dhalamu minhum, except those who injure you. Now, there is another system. There is another system. That when these guys come and knock at your door, how to handle him? <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know how to, I want to teach my brothers that this guy who comes and knocks at your door, the missionary, he's a trained expert <coughs> who comes and knocks at your door. He's not an ordinary fellow. He's trained to argue and debate with you, to steal your iman. He's more dangerous than the Russians in Afghanistan, than the Serbs in Bosnia. Do you know that? If a Muslim, you my son, you went to Afghanistan to help the, the Mujahids against the Russians and if you died, inshallah you'll go to Jannah. If you went to Serbia to help our brothers in Bosnia, in Bosnia, and you get killed, I say, inshallah you are Shaheed, you'll go to Jannah. I believe that. But a Christian comes along and steals your Iman, makes you into a Murtad. You will go to hell and your children will go to hell. I'm asking you who is more dangerous, the Russian and the Serbs or this guy who's coming and knocking at your door. Who is more dangerous to you? Okay. Yes, yes, he's stealing your iman, making you into a murtad, going to start making you to worship a man, Jesus Christ, born in the stable to a Jewish girl, circumcised on the eighth day. He'll make you to believe that he's your God, that Jesus is your God and he died for your sins. He is stealing your iman. 
so said, except with those who harm you, who cause you injury, with them you can use a sledgehammer. Sledgehammer! <laughs> now, I want to teach you, my brothers, how to use the sledgehammer, the kung fu of comparative religion. <laughs> no, no, I, can, I need two hours for that. Two hours for that. Hmm? And I want only 30 students. I know it's a hard job. Because in America, I can see everybody will want to take the course. I can't, it's a, you, it's, a, it's a class. I want to hold a class. 30 students, they can handle at the time. 30 students. I have more than 30, it's right. Second group of 30. But two hours each, two hours each. And I teach you the Kung Fu of comparative religion. That's another department. That's another department. How to slaughter the enemy. You know, how to turn the table against him. It's also very necessary. But to the ordinary Christians, the ordinary person, you speak to him, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati, he expect that he is a good guy. Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are good people. Wa akhtaru humul fasikun, but the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Among the Ahlul Kitab, your customers, the first customers, our customers, for sharing this deen, this honor, this privilege, Allah has given us of being the khaira ummat in the best of people. This is to be shared. And the fittest people to receive that message are the Jews and the Christians. Why? Because they have been prepared. Prophets after prophets have come to them. Allah has given them books after books. They are already prepared to receive the message. If you can correlate with them, talk to them. So, Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, in Surah, Sabbatins, chapter 61, ayah number 6. He says, Hazrat Isa a.s. is made to say, Wa mubashiram bi rasulin yati min badis muhu Ahmad. And giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. Which is another name for Muhammad a.s. So now, we are to tell this to the Christians that look, Jesus Christ, you know, he did prophesy, he did make a basharat of a prophet to come, a rasul to come after him, whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. The Christian will tell you, there's nothing like that in my book. Nothing like that in my book, you're thumb sucking, like a little baby. Where are you enjoying this thumb sucking? Where you get this from? There's nothing in my book. So what are you going to say? You can say the book is changed. <laughs> All right. You have changed your book. You have taken it out. He said, where is the one that is not taken out yet? Have you got it? Show me. But no, my brothers, with all the interpolations, with all the changes that have taken place, that all that they have not preserved, the words, exact words of Isa a.s., there are still some remnants still left inside there. Still. He says, where? He says, here in your book. Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7. What does it say? It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. These are the words supposed to be of Jesus. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. It is better for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. Ask the Christian. Who is this comforter? He says the Holy Ghost. He said the comforter is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I said it doesn't say it's the Holy Ghost. You see? And this Holy Ghost, in the first place, this word comforter, comforter is English. Did Jesus speak English? Did he? No. So what did he say? He didn't use the word comforter. In the Arabic Bible it says, La kinni akulu lakum al haqku, innahu khairul lakum, an antalika, li allahu illa mantalik, la yatikum al muazzi, walakin in zahabtu ursilhu ilaykum. Use the word muazzi. Did Jesus speak Arabic? No. no. So what did he say? In my country, in Zulu, Togozi, you see. Did you speak Zulu? I'm asking them. You're Jesus. In the Afrikaans language, it's a truester. Did you speak Afrikaans? They have the Bible in 2,000 different languages, and in every language the word is different. What did he say? The nearest they have is in Greek, Parakalitos. I said, did you speak Greek? Can you imagine a Jewish prophet coming to the Jews and speaking to them in Greek? Like an American prophet coming to America and speaking to your people in Russian? Does it make sense? Huh? 
an American prophet coming to the Americas and speaking to you people in Russian. Does that make sense to you? Or Chinese? Does that make sense to you? Hmm? What did he say? Hmm? You see, you people, the Christians, have a sickness of translating names of people. They have a sickness of translating names, which you have no right to do. Like, <laughs> the word Christ. Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus, he never heard the word Jesus in his life. Did you know that? He never heard the word Jesus. Christ, he never heard the word Christ. <laughs> in his second coming, if he comes down in New York, hmm, and if the Christians recognize him, and they shout, Jesus, Jesus, I'm telling you as if he won't even turn back and look at you. <laughs> because he never heard the word in his life. He never heard the word Jesus. <laughs> See? See, the only thing is somebody calling his dog or something like that, you know. So, <laughs> no, no, never think that you're calling him. Because he never heard the word Jesus. His real name in his language was Yeshua. Common Esau. Arabic Isa, Hebrew Esau. But they don't want the God to be called by a Jewish name. Esau, Esau means Jew. So they Latinized it and they added the J and they made Jesus. Jesus never heard the word Jesus in his lifetime. Christ. He never heard the word Christ in his lifetime, poor man. He claimed, I'm the Messiah, the Messiah, in Hebrew, Messiah, which means anointed. The Greek word for anointed is Christos, but Christos is too long, so they cut off the os, left with Christ. Just, just. Christ is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. 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 Christ is a translation. So they translated the names of people. If this word Messiah was not known, you'll never know. Peter. Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. You know that? This great man who's supposed to feed his flock, he said, feed my flock, feed my sheep, means look after them. These are my people, my followers, look after them. Peter, Peter. His name was Simon. Simon. He said, Simon, thou art Kephas. Kephas in Hebrew means a rock or stone. Thou art Kephas means we are like a rock, man. And on this rock, on this foundation, I'll build my church. Kephas. Kephas. Simon, thou art Kephas. So they say, thou art Peter. How do you get Peter? Kephas in Hebrew means a rock or stone. Petros in Greek means rock or stone. From the word Petros, they got Peter. Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. No, you have a sickness of translating names. Paul. Paul is not Paul, it's Saul. Saul is a Jew. So they change it to Paul. Sounds American, like sounds Greek or a Roman. Jesus sounds Greek or a Roman, not a Jew. <laughs> Messiah sounds Jew. So say Christ. This thing is a new word come from heaven. Nothing like that. You have a sickness of translating names of people. Jesus did prophesy according to the Quran, Mimbada Ismu Ahmad. But now since you have lost the word, let us examine the prophecy. He says, if I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. He's conditional. He has got to go. If he doesn't go, he won't come. If I go, I will send him. So you say the comforter is the Holy Ghost. I said, now the Holy Ghost, when did he start coming? Open Luke. Luke, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1. Verse 14, it says, And John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. From his mother's stomach. You know, that Holy Ghost that was with him. And he came out with it. I don't know what it means, but this is what the Bible says. And John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam, he had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Verse 47, it says, And Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost before Jesus was born. John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost before Jesus was born. And it says, and Zechariah had the Holy Ghost before Jesus was born. And it says, and Simon, Simeon, Simon, he had the Holy Ghost before Jesus was born. So it doesn't make sense. And Jesus, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, the Spirit of God came from heaven in the shape of a dove and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came down in the shape of a dove on Jesus. So the Holy Ghost was there all the time, helping John the Baptist, helping Elizabeth, helping Zachariah. In your book, in your book, man, everybody seemed to have had the, had the Holy Ghost, including John the Baptist from his mother's womb. He came out with it, with the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine? He's coming out with the Holy Ghost. 
this is what your book says. So it doesn't make any sense that if I don't go, I won't say, I won't, he won't come. I have got to go before I send him. He's there all the time. And he's your disciples, his disciples. How did they heal people? When they preached, with whose help? They said, with the help of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost was there. And before he parted, he told his disciples, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Ah, take it. So was he joking? <laughs> hmm? I said, I take I a note from my pocket. It's a hundred dollars. Here, I give it to you, my son. Ta, hundred dollars. Then I'm joking. There's nothing there. Did Jesus do that? Playing fools? I can. Play fools with you. Did Jesus do that? He said, receive. Did they receive or not? He must have received, man. <laughs> so it makes no sense. Then in chapter 14, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity. I have knowledge. I have solution to all your problems till doomsday. But you, my disciples, are not fit. You are not fit to receive it. And the truth of that statement is writ large in the Christian Bible. Again and again, Jesus tells his disciples, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, you got no iman. Very kalil, kalil, iman. How many times? <laughs> Dozens of times. And he's explaining to them as he was explaining to little children. And they can't understand. So he said, I even yet without understanding? Yet, you can't understand, I'm talking to you like a little child, man. And you can't understand what I'm talking. Everything that he says, they misunderstand. And he's, when he's provoked further, he said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I said, if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri, suicide. <laughs> but he's a Jew. Life is dear to him. He can't afford to do that. So he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Who is the spirit of truth? He said, the Holy Ghost, again. The Holy Ghost. They fall in love with the Holy Ghost. I said, look, who has got the Holy Ghost? Every church and denomination. In Christendom, they have the gift of the Holy Ghost, they say. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they got the Holy Ghost. The Roman Catholics got the Holy Ghost. The Anglicans, you call them Episcopals, they got the Holy Ghost. The Mennonites got the Holy Ghost. The Christadelphians got the Holy Ghost. The Mormons, there are 40 different Baptist churches, different Baptist churches, and they all have the Holy Ghost. There are a thousand different sects and denominations among the whites of South Africa, and 3,000 among the blacks of South Africa, and everyone has got the Holy Ghost. So, what did this Holy Ghost teach you in 2,000 years? Something that Jesus didn't tell you in so many different words. Give me one. He said, I have yet many. Many means more than one in English. All truth. I'll guide you into all. To God, all means more than one. I don't want more than one. I want only one. Give me just one new thing that this Holy Ghost gave any church in 2,000 years. There is it. I said, let me quote you. This verse. Again with a little emphasis on the pronouns. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. It ill befits a ghost, a spook. In any language, he should be it. When it is come, it, it. He says, he, 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 he is talking about a man, a man, a man, and not a spook, not a ghost, not a spirit. <laughs> and I want to be a Karim Sahasan. He guided mankind into all truth. Solution to all your problems. And you have problems. You Americans, you have problems. America, especially America, has got problems. And Islam has answers to the problems. But we are not, we are not the messengers of that message to them. We are not. We haven't played our role the way we ought to play. We haven't done the job. We are here for a living. And Osman Don Fodio of Nigeria, who fought against the British, he said, he said, no Muslim has a right to remain anywhere in a minority situation unless he's there for jihad or for dawah. You are here for living, this is haram. 
Look, I don't say that. You hear just for a living? Men, dogs and pigs and all, they also live and procreate. Is that the only motive you are here? It doesn't mean you mustn't work, you must earn your living. Alhamdulillah, go ahead. Halal rizq, earn. But your primary purpose is do dawa or jihad. With the intellect. And Allah has given you. He said, He's given you a deen that is a master who come and supersede them all. Kulli. Bulldoze them all. Kulli. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. Wallahu karihal mushrikun. Allah says, never mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. Does it look like that? No. We are like punching bags for people practicing on us. They're using us as a doormat. This is the role of a Muslim. I said, we might as well get lost, man. We must get out of it. Look, Allah, if this is the role Allah has in store for me, that I must get a beating hmm? from the Nasara and the Jews. If this is the role Allah has for me, then I should get out of Islam. This is not the role. The role is, li use a hira hu kulli. How? With the gun? With the grenade? He says, no. Like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Even if he had the laser gun, you are disqualified. You can't say, I'll blast you unless you become a Muslim. Allah says, no, you can't do that. Then how? I say, with the intellect. Learn to talk, man. Learn to talk. <laughs> One of my Saudi brothers, you know, he discovered an art, a new way of getting at the Americans. He's sharing this with me. A Saudi. He said, when I go to America, when I meet the American, his usual his accent, you can make out he's an Arab. The Saudi, most of you I can't make out. You don't sound like Arabs. You know, you're getting Americanized. Most of you are Americanized. But that man is from Arabia, raw, raw stuff from Saudi Arabia. So he speaks more like an Arab. He says, you know, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Hmm? And I got four wives. <laughs> well, sure bait. Any American is a sure bait to catch any American. I got four wives. Because he wants to know how many wives you got. The Arab, how many wives you got? You know, to him it's a joke. How many wives you got? <laughs> how many wives you got? <laughs> That's a sure bait, man. Catch the fish. See? That guy's gonna bite that. So what? You have four you unjust people, you you, <laughs> you barbarians. In two minutes time he changed. He said, no, no, what I mean is that I got only one wife, but I'm allowed up to four. See, he changed it. First he starts, baits the guy, says, I got four wives. Hmm? Now the guy starts, the American, he won't let you go. So then this is a nice toy, this is a nice toy, this Arab, you know. Hmm? Start playing marbles with him. So, he said, no, you see, I'm allowed up to four wives. The Quran says, marry women of your choice by two and threes and fours but if you cannot do justice between them marry only one I got only one but this is a solution to your problem sir See, this, you baited him he's now he started with you so now you tell him sir this is a problem this is a solution to your problem Islam offers you a solution to your problem so you have a problem sir according to your statistics there are 7.8 million more women than men did you know that America has got 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, there will still be 7.8 million women in America who can't get husbands. Did you know that? This is your statistics, man. Your government gives it to us. You don't read newspapers. Amazing. You know, Muslims. We are supposed to be the Iqra community. Allah says, Iqra, and we will say, La Iqra. We won't read. No, no. You don't say that. That's kufr. But in our mind, our behavior, we are a like our community. We don't even read newspapers. Maybe with the TVs, you get glued up with the TVs, but newspapers you don't read. 7.8 million more women than men. And every man will never get married. You know, mad, man gets cold feet for so many different reasons. Do you know that? <laughs> the guy is not married. He's 45, 50. So what's wrong with you, man? Come on, man. There's a widow here, or there's a divorcee. Come on, man. Good lady. She was unfortunate, man. This thing happened. Come. Yes. When he's come to the kind the guy, he has cold feet. He knows why. Maybe he knows he can't make the grade. He knows, he knows why. Somehow finds an excuse for getting out. Every man will never get married. Then of the main man, manpower you have, there are 25 million sodomites, you call them gays. Another 25 million women can't get husbands. 
<laughs> that makes 32 million. Huh? If every man got married, 25 million sodomites, they won't marry. Hmm? And 7.8 million to start with, 32 million. And your prison population, 98% are males. 98% of your prison population is males. Your problem is getting compounded. Islam offers you a solution. If you don't accept the solution, then you simmer in your soup. Literally, your women folk are going to the dogs. That's what the Saudi says. Literally, your women folk are going to the dogs. He's asking, have you read Dr. Kinsey's The Life of the American Female? Any one of you have got that book? Dr. Kinsey's The Life of the American Female. Anybody there, put up your hand. Have you ever seen that book in your life? Not one. Masters and Johnson, the latest on sexology in America. So anybody has read that, put up your hand, please. Not one. <laughs> Ask him, have you read Masters and Johnson? Have you read Dr. Kinsey's The Life of the American Female? What he tells you, so literally your nation is going to the dogs. Islam answers your solution. If you don't listen, you simmer in your soup. <laughs> he starts with another American. He says, you know I come from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and I'm a terrorist. Terrorist? You're a terrorist? <laughs> you say, I'm a terrorist. I'm a terrorist, you see. <laughs> sure bait, man, sure bait for the American. Look, this Saudi has got the art of getting started. I'm a terrorist. Terrorist? you terrorist? No, no, you, see, you people like to say how tourists coming along and, you know, seeing your Statue of Liberty and everything else. You see, you mean, tourist? See, it's just tourist, tourist. <laughs> You start with terrorists, he changed to... He said, well, more poor Arab, you know, he doesn't know how to say tourists, he said terrorists. But, shh, you broke the ice. Get started, man, wallah. There's a hundred different ways of getting started, my dear brothers. Man, if you only look for it, you want to do the job, you'll find a hundred different ways of getting. Get my books, get my books. There's a storm, I think it's available downstairs, free of charge. There's a storm. What the Bible says about Muhammad, master the little booklet. Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ, master the booklet. Is the Bible God's word? All these things are available here in your New York, in the Islamic Propagation Center, here somewhere here in uh, what you call them? I don't know. Queens. 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 Yeah. You know, Mr. Akil Khan. Man, get these books. Learn a verse, master it, memorize it, and look for opportunities. If nothing else, the Quranic ayah, Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 42. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. Memorize it. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Memorize the meaning. And find, create opportunities with your neighbors. Invite them home for a cup of tea and your cookies. Or a cup of tea and your samosas. Wallah, you can enslave people. The Pakistani, I'm telling you. You can enslave people with your food. You know that? Damn it all, man. What an opportunity. You can enslave people with your food. I don't know so much about the Arab food, but the Pakistani food has, has something special, you know. This Afghan fellow here, and that Kabul fellow here, you know, I don't know if you tried them. Look, I'm not trying to, to, to get a commission from that Kabul fellow or that Afghan fellow, but you go and try, it enslaves people. Man, enslave the guy, feed them, talk to them. With these, my dear brothers, I think I would leave it to you to ask questions, but the chairman had said, written slips, I do not like written slips. From my sisters, I don't mind. But you, my brothers, you, my sons, if you can't stand up and ask your uncle, your grandfather a question, how are you going to give battle to the Nasara? I want to know. Huh? You can't ask me, stand up in front of him, say, my uncle, whether Mr. D that or whatever you want to say, if you can't ask me a question, you want to write, you want to write, this is a cowardly thing to do, writing all these papers, pieces of papers. It's a cowardly thing. Stand up, ask your question, so you can also be recorded for the camera. It makes it living, living. Otherwise, I could have given this to the chairman and said, look, come on, man, read out this question and I'll answer. Read out that question and I will answer. No. Stand up and ask your question. Yes, my brothers. Yes, Mr. Chairman, you give them the, the go. Which one? <laughs> You want juice? Yes, brother, would you please? Alaikum salam. What's the main difference between 
What is the question? What is the main difference between a Jehovah Witness and a regular uh, The general, generality of Christendom, the bulk of Christendom, they believe in the Holy Trinity. They believe in the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. They believe that the Father is God, the Son is God and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods but one God. They say that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, the Catechism. All the Christendom. Same. Same. They say the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they are not three persons, but one person. That they believe in the Holy Trinity. The main difference between the Jehovah's Witness and the Orthodox Christian is this Trinity. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they say there is no Trinity. But they still believe that Christ is a super being, is second to God, and he died for the sins. He still believes that the Bible is the word of God, like the other Christians. The only real difference is that they say that Jesus is not God, in that they are one with us. We say Walata Kuru Salasa, don't say Trinity, they say we don't say Trinity. That they have accepted, but the rest they are still with the Christians. Right, next. Thank you. Assalam. Alaikum First one, I would like to ask you what did you do to approach the Christian Christian community? And second one, what did you do to confront the Christian process going on in Indonesia? What do you do to the Christian community? What do you do? This is what I have been trying to demonstrate to you. Talk to the guy, man. Talk to him about what the Quran says, but now show it to him in his book. And to do that, get this little booklet of mine, which will arm you with this knowledge, what the Bible says about Muhammad. What did I do? Huh? Yeah, what I'm doing now. That's what I'm doing for 40 years. What I'm doing now. Same. Yes, brother. Alhamdulillah. I have a question. Being raised and born as a Muslim in the United States, myself, my father being Muslim, uh, and a lot of American sisters, brothers, we, in this society, our families from the 60s have been divided. Okay, the women from the man, the man put in the position above, below this woman, the woman above him, due to the fact that we struggle at one time to try to get ourselves so far equal rights. Uh, I have found out in my journey on the uh, that in Islam, we find a lot of brothers come here from other countries, and they like to marry our women, our American women. I would like to understand why is it that we are not, on majority of cases, allowed to marry so-called Arab men, and they do not allow us to marry their daughters and whatnot, in order for us to get this unity. It's like going to tell the Islam when he married it to the, the Jewish community in order to bring the unity amongst them. And the reason why do not we not be as Americans, especially Afro-Americans that they so-called at this time, uh, not allowed to marry into the so-called Arab families so that we can unite and kind of have some type of family structure along with you all family structure introduced to our own women so that we can come back to where we once were. So inshallah, could you give me some guidance on that? Yes, my brother. Yes, my brother. You see, we are all racists. Everybody, whether an Arab or a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi or an African, you Afro-American, I say, everyone is a racist. You see, when, as soon as you think in terms of, you see, that guy is marrying my daughter and I can't marry his daughter, you are a racist. You are a racist. You see, but now you are a victim. You feel that you are downtrodden. You see, you are put at a disadvantage. To me, I say, you have an advantage if that is happening. You have a surplus of women, man. Your women, like the white women, are going literally to the dogs. Your statistics tell me that 66, 33% of the whites, Caucasian, the children are born out of wedlock. 
means bastard. 33% of all children born in America are bastards. 66% of the Afro-American children, they say, are bastards. No father. Am I right? So, man, if that is the case, I said, look, man, anybody, any Muslim wants to come and marry my daughter, come <laughs> get the responsibility off my head, man. If, if the Arab comes along and I marry my daughter, just take it, man. Pakistani comes along, rather than marrying the mushrik, rather than marrying the Christian, huh? I said, anybody, man, come, any Muslim, come along and marry my daughter, Nurun Allah Nur. But we have these prejudices, we have. It takes time. Wallah, it takes time. What's happening? A lot of brothers are winding up going out there marrying these Christians. So called bring them into the They're going back out. The brothers and moms are being pulled down. They have children out there that are striving to deal with these children because these children were well, maybe a time before they came into Islam. And they're out there and they're striving to bring the children into Islam. And all this is prejudice. This is not Islam. These are both coming. No, no, you see, racism. Racism. We, we have inherited this. You know, like me, my nation, I'm an Indian. I'm an Indian by birth. My nation, for 5,000 years my people were Hindus. 5,000 years my nation is Hindu, racist, caste distinction, my nation. Out of that I have come out, I have become a Muslim. And Alhamdulillah I would say that we today are the least racist among the Indian people, least racist. But I can't say that we are pure, we are immaculate, you know, we have got rid of it. Still, that Hindu blood is still running in our veins. Maybe the Arabs also. You know, Ayyamul Jahiliya. You know, that blood is still running in their veins. It'll take time before we implement innamal mu'minuna ikhwatun, that all, mu'min, all brothers, we are all brothers. It is going to take time. But you must deem it as a favor. If a Muslim comes and marries your sister, says, Ahlan wa sallam, take it, my brother. Salam is the back. We are the window. Yes. Close to the window. Yes. Do you believe that the Bible deals with incest? Do you believe that the Bible deals with incest? Do you believe that the Bible deals with incest? Yes, my brother, the Bible is a textbook on incest. It's a textbook. If you want to know the types and types, and types of incest, you know what is incest? No. no. You see, when you go out with somebody else's wife or daughter and cohibit with them, it is called adultery or fornication. Okay. But when you have sex with your own mother, that's incest. With your own daughter, that's incest. With your sister, that's incest. Now you understand what is incest. And the Bible is a text. Now please, 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 please tell me. Have patience, have patience. My brother, please have patience. Please. The Bible is a textbook on incest. You see, when the Christian missionary comes, now this is, this is the art, you start with the guy. He wants to push the Bible down your throat. He's finding ways and means to get the Bible to you. If he comes with the Bible, you ask him, he says, now, what's that? Is that the Bible? He said, yes, can I have a look? Oh, he'll be happy to give it to you. That's what he wants. He wants you to handle his Bible, to read his Bible. Now, you open the book. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 19, verse 30. And you give it back to him. He said, read this. Read this. You come with the Bible. You want to preach to me? I want, you to, I want to hear you read. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 19, verse 30. Give it back to him. He said, read this. In his Bible, read it. And he's not going to read. He's trained. He's a trained missionary. He doesn't follow instructions. He's trained. He's going to scan. And he smells a rat. You know, he smells a rat. Dead rat. Stinking. He wants to change the subject. He wants to say, what work are you doing? Huh? What is the price of oil in your country? What is the price of onions? Damn it all. I said, look, is that the book of God? He said, yes, I want to hear you read. <laughs> so bring it here. Bring it here. Then I said, I have to read it to him. You will have to read it to him. And what do you read? Hazrat Lut a prophet of God. After the destruction of his nation, Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes and lives in a cave with his daughters. And the eldest daughter in the cave, she, she has an idea. 
of wanting to preserve the seed, the genealogy of our father. So he said, let us make our father drink wine and we will sleep with him and preserve the seed of our father. I'm reading the Holy Bible. This is the Holy Bible talking. So they make the father drink wine and the eldest daughter goes and has sex with her father. And she tells the younger next night, he said, look, yesterday night I spoke with my father. You do the same tonight. You go and do the same. So they made the father drink wine again. And the second one went and slept with the father, had sex with the father. And thus, both the daughters of Lot will be child by the father. Thus, just like that, hakaza. Both the daughters of Lot will be child by the father. So ask the Christian, I'm asking the Christian, what is the moral of that? Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. You see, I have a book called Combat Kit. The next time when I come, inshallah, you know, this I'll have to give it to you. How to give battle to the Nasara, how to ki give the king, king Fu Kung Fu blow, you know, as a knockout blow. Slaughter the guy without getting hurt. You don't need guns, you don't need grenades. You can do it with the intellect, with knowledge. So asking the Christian, what is the moral of this story? Genesis, still Genesis, chapter 35, verse 22, it speaks about Reuben, the eldest son of Yaqub alayhi salam. He goes and has sex with his mother. And the Bible says, and Israel heard it. People told him, he says, your son, he had sex with, his, with your wife, your father's wife. What is she to you? Your mother. He went and slept with his mother. Hazrat is, Yaqub alayhi salam was told, and he didn't lose his temper. Nothing. He didn't get angry. His blood pressure didn't go up. He didn't scold the fellow. He didn't spank the fellow. Nothing. And Allah didn't give him AIDS, gonorrhea, or syphilis. What's the moral? Still Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 38. Verses 15 to 18, he speaks about Judah, the father of the Jewish race. He's going to Timnath to share his sheep. And he sees a woman sitting by the roadside, his daughter-in-law. So he thinks she's a harlot, a whore, a bitch. So she, he comes up to her and he says, allow me to come in unto thee, let me have sex with you. So she said, what will you give me? Teaching your daughters prostitution. Then the first book of the Bible, teaching your daughters and your sisters prostitution. When somebody says, come on, come on, he said, what will you give me, uncle? So I give you 50 cents. Can't you make it a dollar? Huh? <laughs> Teaching your daughters to do prostitution. So he said, what will you give me? He said, I'll give you a goat kid. Because they didn't carry cash or credit cards those days. They didn't have that. <laughs> so he said, I'll give you a goat kid. He said, what guarantee are you going to give it? You'll enjoy me and you go away. He said, what guarantee do you want? He said, your signet and your bracelet and your star. Asai Musa, he was carrying. Hmm? Judah, Judah, the father of the Jewish race. Judah. From whom you get the word Judaism, Judea, Huda, Yehuda, Yehudi, all that come from Judah. That man, he cohibits with his daughter-in-law. And first hit, he makes her pregnant. Twins, twins. And these in children of incest, these bastard children, are the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus. I'm telling the Christian, these are the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus Christ. What is the moral? What is the moral of that? No moral. Immoral. It's shit, wallah, shit. With the shit that guy is getting customers. With that shit, the Christian is getting customers. And you and I, you can't get customers with the Quran. Come on, tell me why. Why I give you this book. The first one give me the right answer. You and I, we can't get customers with the Quran, and the Christian is catching fish with that shit. Why? Come, come, come. Huh? Yeah, we don't open our mouth. That's the answer. We don't open our mouth. Give it to him. We don't open our mouth. You're not talking, man. You don't talk. That guy's talking. Any bloody rubbish man you can sell. You know, my lemons are sweet. My lemons are sweet. Lemons are lemons are sour, man. But I keep on saying my lemons are very sweet. My lemon some fool will buy. You know that? <laughs> Maybe this is sweet lemon. It's a sweet lemon. Because even sweet lemons are sour. Did you know that? They call them sweet lemons in my country. There are lemons. They call sweet lemons. But they're still sour. <laughs> but I say, my lemons are very sweet. Some fool will buy. That guy is selling. You're not talking. You're not selling. Open your mouth, man. Anything. Just open your mouth. If you can't talk anything, at least you can talk about your hygiene. Your taharat. If nothing at all, wear a hat. Look, wear a cloak. Wear a cap. If nothing at all, you can't do anything at all, I say wear a cap. This thing here. This, you know how powerful this is? You don't know. You don't know the strength of this. <laughs> I land here in Kennedy Airport with my son and my grandson. All we have this, everybody. 
the immigration officer, he goes through my pass our passports, he sees the visas and he stamps it. Then he looks up, he sees this. He said, what is this for? No, he's not trying to be funny. Sincerely, he wants to know, why this? You know, white, white, white. He said, no, this is our identity. We are Muslims. So what is that? He's not trying to be funny, man. He's, he sincerely wants to know what is a Muslim. I said, there are 1,000 million Muslims in the world. You don't know That's the religion of Islam, therefore, I said, no, I don't know. You think he's joking? No, no, Allah is speaking the truth. The guy wants to know. Then he says, yes, he's from China, this man. He's educated in America. He said, and to get a job in immigration, you don't pick up any Tom, Dick and Harry from Brooklyn or, or your Manhattan. You know, these are educated people. Right, the guy is there. He's originally from China. He's educated in America. So he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, in China there are some people, I think they call them Muslims, certain areas. I say, yeah, we've got 50 million Muslims in China. He said, you know, they don't eat the pig. I said, yes, we all Muslims, we don't eat the pig. He said, why? Now he wants to know why. Man, opening up doorways for you. From Chicago to J.F. Kennedy, the hostess. He said, why you got this on? This is an open sesame, opening the doors for you. But we Muslims here, I addressed a, a group of ladies, 300, a couple of days ago, somewhere here in New York. Everyone with hijab, 100% hijab. You want your mothers and daughters and sisters to wear hijab? Your wives, huh? Yes. What's wrong with you? Why don't you, why are you afraid to identify yourself? Why are you ashamed to identify yourself that you are a Muslim? When you want your mothers and wives and daughters, you know, to risk their necks, to wear all those things, I am for it, I am for it. But I am asking that if you want your mothers and sisters and daughters to wear the hijab, why won't you identify yourself that you are a Muslim? It's an open society, it opens the door away for you, the government says, what are you? Huh? I tell them, I say, look, I am a fundamentalist. Every hotel I go to, the receptionist, I hear the chance, I say, yeah, I am a fundamentalist. Huh? I think I have got a gun. No, you know, with a smiling face, man. You know, I'm a fundamentalist. You know, you think they think I've got a gun with me, a grenade with me? No, no, no. Then I start telling what is a fundamentalist. So they're fascinated. Wallah, they are hungry. They want to know why this, why that. Right? You are ashamed to identify yourself. If you only identify yourself, I'm told there are 800,000 Muslims in New York. More than that. Okay, 800,000. If you people have an identity, you will terrify the enemy out of his wits. With all your guns and grenades can't do, he just looks at you, said, why so many Muslims in, in, in Manhattan, in Bronx, so Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. Because if you have an identity, that's the only thing the guy sees. All the others are sheep and goats, you don't notice them. All the others are, are, are incognito, you know, are, you're not worth anything to give you a second look. They're sick. The sick, you know the sick people in India, they have the turbans and they have the beard, when it overgrows it goes back again into the beard, into the turban. No, no, no that's a uniform. That uniform gives them power. In India, they are one, one tenth of the Muslims. We are 150 million Muslims in India, a minority of 150 million people. But we are like sheep and goats, not worth tuppence in that country. You know that? The handful of six. Indira Gandhi was bending backwards to appease them and Rajiv Gandhi gave them everything except independence. Why? Uniform. They have a uniform. Uniform gives you power, recognition. There's somebody, you are somebody, you are somebody. This is your identity. And for my sake, I want to meet my brothers in the street and I wish you salams. He said, Allah doesn't need this. I say, I know. He doesn't need this. I know. Between you and Allah, no problem. If you deserve Jannah, Allah will give you. If you deserve Jahannam, He'll put you there. He won't make a mistake with you. But me, your brother, I want to recognize you that I can wish you salams in the street and you can wish me back. Why are you depriving me of that opportunity? No. No, my brother. No. No, my brothers. You know, my brothers are talking about establishing an Islamic State and I said, look, you can't, have, you haven't got the guts to put on a hat and you want to start, you want to establish an Islamic State. Hmm? What? You can't make this sacrifice of this to put on your head and you want to create an Islamic State and you want to rule the world. 
you hypocrites, look, leave it out, leave it out now. Don't start with me. I said, look, you haven't got the guts, man, to put this on. You want your wives and daughters to identify themselves, and you are ashamed to identify yourself. Shame on you. Please forgive me, but this is the haq, this is the truth. Yes, next question. Right, okay, I did it. This is from our sisters, yes. From the sixth floor, how do we answer a Christian when he says that Christians do more to help the unfortunate people of the world than Muslims do, like aid to Ethiopia, Bosnia? Uh, the, yeah, look, it, I it. Our sister is asking, how do we answer a Christian when he says that Christians do more to help the unfortunate people of the world than Muslims do? Like aid to Ethiopia and Bosnia, a Muslim sister, she's asking. Maybe, maybe they are. They are doing things. But they have a motive. You see, they are not throwing bait on, bread on the water for the fish to feed. They want to catch fish. Everything that they do, education, in the case of education, catching fish. Uh, hospitals, catching fish. They want to convert the people, right? They have a motive. And why shouldn't we have also a motive? We can also do the same, but somehow we are not programmed. The Christian is programmed, he's trained, he's told for Christ. The world, this is Africa for Christianity, Africa. Asia for Christianity. You see, these people of the world, they're all going to go to hell. They haven't accepted the living Christ. Jesus, he died for the sins. And these people, the Muslims, especially the Muslims, are a challenge to them. The Muslims have not accepted Christ. They have accepted him in everything. They're almost there. They only need a gentle push. Because the Muslim believes in Jesus. In his miraculous birth, that he is the Messiah, the Messiah, he gave life back to the dead by Allah's permission, he healed those born blind and the lepers by Allah's permission. We believe, we believe, we believe. But we have not accepted him that he died for your sins. That's all that he needs. He needs a gentle push. Now, here is a bait, education. <coughs> and they did it, they did it in Africa. When the British conquered most of these nations, Nigeria, Ghana, Malawi, Tanzania, wherever they conquered, Education was given to the missionaries to handle it. And the missionaries made it a condition. No Christianization, no education. So a lot of our children, our fathers, they send their children to school under the Christian nom de plume, thinking they're going to steal education. And in the process we lost. Hundreds, thousands of children we lost. Programming, brainwashed, edu in the guise of education. So the guy has got a motive, an ulterior motive, is not for the love of the people in Somalia that the guy is there. He is there to do a job. The more trouble you are in, the more greater your misfortune, the greater the opportunity for him. He is now capitalizing in, on your misery. Your misery now how we can exploit. But we should Muslims, we should also, we are doing, but what we do is Jimmy Carter goes to the Arab countries and he collects millions. Millions of dollars he collected from the Middle East. But he gave it to Christian missions. Our money. See, we are fools. Wallah, we are fools. We don't know. The guys are using us. They're using our money to do the job. So the thing is now, it is about time that we also, among us, we haven't got that type of, type of dedication. That we are prepared to dedicate our lives. The American, he goes to Borneo. Among the headhunters. He goes to the Philippines. He goes all over the world in unhygienic conditions, torrid climate, to preach Jesus. How many Muslims are there in the world who are prepared to go to another country? Forget another country here in this own country here, man. The Red Indians. Who's prepared to go and talk to the Red Indians? Nobody. Nobody. To the Hispanics. Who's prepared to talk to them now? The Koreans here. The China. Who's prepared to do anything? Nothing. You know why? Because you are not told. We are not told. You see, from the mimbar, if you are told again and again that this is the awwal for the Muslim is to do da'wah. Awwal far. Long before salat, zakat, hajj and song became far, Allah tells his Rasul and through him is telling us. He says, Fazakir inna ma anta musakir. So you, you deliver the message because it is your duty to deliver the message. Lasta alayhim bi musaitir. You will not be questioned regarding them. Illa man tawalla wa kafar. Why they accepted or why they didn't accept, Allah won't ask you. He will ask you, did you deliver the message? 
And if you can say, Ya Bari Tala, oh my Lord, I tried to the best of my ability, whether it was very little or very great, Allah says, Jannah is for you. He won't ask you, why didn't you do like Didat? Or Imam Siraj Wahaj? Or, no, no. He won't ask you that. Like Sheikh bin Baz or Sheikh of Al Azhar, mm, did you deliver the message? And if you can honestly say, Oh my Lord, I tried with what little I know. He said, my Jannah is open for you. But we are not doing the job. It's about time that every Muslim learn to open his mouth. You don't have to be qualified. You don't have to become Hafiz al-Quran or Hafiz al-Bible. Our Nabi Kareem sallallahu is a ballighu anni wa law ayah. Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. You know one fact? You don't know one fact about Islam? Pity man. What about your hygiene? Talk man, talk. Anything man, talk. At the worst, he say, you look like Muslim man. You know, he say, you look like Muslim. Anybody you meet, he stops you, he say, you know, you look like Muslim. You know, you're talking like a Muslim. <laughs> you know, you're doing the job. You know that? He say, you look like Muslim. Hey, you know, you're talking like a Muslim. <laughs> What's exceptional about the Muslim? No, no, you just, you look like a Muslim man. Hey, you're talking like a Muslim. Huh? He says, maybe his father was a Muslim. He doesn't know. Look, man, talk, man, talk. I think we should close the meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. One. Just one more. One more. Right. Uh, one more question. The brother here would like to ask the question, the last question. Yes, brother. Uh, my question to you, yeah. Yeah, uh, I've seen your tears, most of the day, mostly all over the world. I've seen you in Canada, in Nigeria, mostly all over the world. But here is my, my, my main question is, why is it that you only debate on Christian, Christianity and Muslim? Why can't you use your own knowledge that Allah bless you, may Allah bless your knowledge, may Allah bless you more. To educate us in order to give us, uh, like the book that you show us, in order to have uh, that book, the red book, the explanation of Arabic words, the real meaning. Because I understand from my learning that Arabic has a lot of meaning. But your interpretation of it, will enlighten mostly English speaking Muslims. Why don't we do that? Yeah, I have to wait. <laughs> My dear brother, you see, this is a world of specialization. Do you know what that means? Hmm? I have specialized in comparative religion. There are so many other brothers. Like the sheikhs of Al Azhar, they specialize in Arabic. You can't go and tell them, why don't you teach us comparative religion? Why don't you teach us how to battle the Jew? How to battle the Christian? How to battle the atheist, the agnostic? Now that you come and ask me. You see, how do you handle the Jew? How do you handle the atheist? How do you handle the Hindu? Now that you have a right to come and ask me. You want me to go and do, teach you people Arabic? Look, in the first place, I myself don't know Arabic. Wallah. I only read, and through the meaning, a translation, like the one I was referring to you, I have my knowledge from there. I don't know Arabic as a language. So, my brother, this is beyond me. What I know, I give. That is all. Jazakallah. <laughs> Thank you.